Hi everybody, welcome to Elementary Classical Mechanics, the subject where observing the universe suggests new mathematical and computational approaches that can literally transform our way of modeling and predicting any aspect of the world. Hi everybody, welcome back to the second lecture of chapter four. In this lecture, we're gonna make the transition to dynamics and discuss Newton's laws. Okay, Newton's laws or Newton's axioms. Why do I call them axioms? Well, as I, as you probably guessed from the introductory lecture, I'm heavily influenced by the beautiful little book of Sommerfeld. And Sommerfeld makes the point that these three laws of Newton should be regarded as axioms. We can't prove them. We take them as axioms and we derive the consequences. Okay, so here are the three axioms or the three laws. Number one, every particle. So in this course, we're essentially going to be considering um, the motion of particles of mass m. Um, not many instances of more than one particle, a few, but uh, mostly the motion of particles of mass m. So every particle persists in a state of rest or of uniform motion. Uniform, remember motion is measured through its velocity, uniform, constant in direction, constant in magnitude. In a straight line, unless acted on by a force. This is a pretty far reaching law, Newton's first law. Actually, Galileo, I mentioned, discovered it first, but um, if a body is not going to change what it's doing unless a force acts on it, and it's going to change it in a way that's in the direction of the force. That's why vectors are important. Okay, number two. If F is a force acting on a particle of mass m, which as a consequence of moving with velocity v, then F is the time rate of change of the quantity mv. And mv is what we call the momentum. So the force is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum, dpvt. There's no force, the momentum is constant. Well, we'll get to that later. Okay, for us, if generally our masses are going to be time independent. And there are a lot of very interesting problems like missiles and rockets where their mass changes, they, they consume fuel. But if the mass is constant, we can pull it out of the derivative and we have F equals m dv dt. dv dt is acceleration. And we have the famous F equals ma expression. Now that's a differential equation because a is a second derivative of the position. We, if we know the force, we have a differential equation, we can solve for the motion. The motion is the position vector. Finally, the third law refers to two particles. Particle one acts on particle two with a force F12, one, two, one acting on twos, hence the subscript. In a direction along the line joining the two particles, while particle 2 acts on particle 1 with the force F21. Hence, well then, the law says that F21 equals minus F12. And this is the origin of the statement. To every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The classic set of problems illustrating this are um, billiards. Two balls, hard balls that don't deform, uh, colliding and then moving apart. Okay, let's look at a simple example. A particle of mass m moves in the xy plane in such a way that its position vector is given by this. a cosine omega t i plus b sine omega t j. a, b, and omega are constants. And I, for no particular reason, I've chosen a to be strictly larger than b. So, 
Question one, show that the particle moves in an ellipse. Often in applications, you want to know the shape of the curve along which the particle moves. So x is a cosine omega t, y is p sine omega t. The equation for an ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. We plug in these values of x and y, and we get x squared over a squared, I forgot to say the punchline, plus y squared over b squared equals 1. That's the equation for an ellipse. Problem 2, question 2, show that the force acting on the particle is always acting towards the origin. You've had an exercise at the end of the chapter a while back asking that you do something like this. So the force is equal to m dv dt, which is m second derivative of r with respect to t twice. Well, we know what r is. We differentiate it twice. We get this. We pull out minus omega squared, and we get minus m omega squared times well, that's just a position vector. So this tells me that the force is proportional to the position vector, but with a negative constant. So the force is directed not away from the origin, the position vector points away, but towards the origin because of the negative sign. Okay, when you learn this after a while, this subject, classical mechanics, after a while, you start wondering, well, what is force? What is mass? Good questions. We're not going to go into that in here. I mean, they, there is the, these answers are still at the heart of, of much research in physics. Where does mass come from? What is it? What's a particle? Uh, and then the different types of forces. For us, mass is going to be something we measure, quantity of matter and we're not going to really question what it is. Um, a few things will come up now and then, things like mass and weight, and then, then we'll touch on this. But uh, for the most part, I just, um, I just point this out now. Now, units and dimension. Well, the quantities we're going to look at, uh, mass, that's a dimension. Is it measured in, in pounds, kilograms? grams, uh, time, dimension, is it seconds, hours, days, and length, okay, uh, feet, meters, millimeters. Well, as a mathematician, we don't worry too much about that. We, we tend to non-dimensionalize things and, and, uh, and just uh, manipulate the mathematics, which is fine, but if you're an applied mathematician, and I've learned this the hard way, <laughs> someday you're going to have to really grapple with units and dimensions, and each area of application has its own types of, uh, own favorite uh, system of units. So I, I made a little table here for different types of physical quantities or dimensions and units in the uh, different uh, systems. I just put this here for um, for completeness. We're not going to need to worry about it too much. We may refer to it occasionally later on, but not much. But it's here, and you know it's here. You can sleep easier at night. Okay, that's it for this lecture. I'm going to finish up the chapter by talking about coordinate systems, absolute motion, and the notion of an inertial coordinate system. So bye for now.